It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you. I've been in Cache Valley now for two years, and I just love being here, and I love Utah State University. And so it's a thrill to be with you and speak with you this morning. I really believe very strongly that the things I will talk about today can significantly benefit you personally, your career, and your business, okay? So that's a promise I make to you. How many of you own or work within a small business right now? Okay, pretty much everybody. Okay, how many of you want to start a small business someday? You can't raise your hand if your employer's here, right? Okay. <laughs> um, let me tell you a story of how the concepts I'm going to teach today came about. It was a few years ago, I was sitting in my office, and the phone rang, and it was a gentleman named Michael Saruya, and he was calling me from Toronto, Canada. And he was the chairman of the board of a very large publicly traded company in the food industry that traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And he said, Mike, I want to get right to the point. He says, I'm thorough. I've done my homework. I want to buy your company. I said, Michael, I'm flattered. Thank you for calling. But the company's not for sale. And he said, oh, but Mike, every company is sale, for sale for the right price and the right terms and the right conditions. So he told me what he was doing. He had raised uh, millions of dollars on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and he was coming to America buying up specialty food companies, manufacturing companies, distribution companies, retailing companies, and he was trying to roll up the specialty food industry in the United States. So I said, you could come visit for a few days, and I gave him the days, and he flew to Salt Lake City. After a couple of days of due diligence, he said, I still want your company. Here's my formal offer, and he handed me an offer sheet. Now, we had had our company valued, and we'd had other offers on it over the last year, and so I knew what we would sell it for. And I said, Michael, uh, it's been great meeting you. This isn't enough. And he said, okay, you write on the bottom of that piece of paper how much you would sell it for, and I will think about it and come back tomorrow. So I said, great, it's not for sale. So I wrote down a really big number. It was quite a bit bigger than what he had offered. And he came back the next day, and he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy your company but there's two conditions that are deal killers. If you do not comply with both of these deals, I'm gonna get on my plane and fly back to Canada. I said, okay. So the first one was, we have an office in Dallas, Texas. We have an executive staff with a brand new CEO from the food industry. Uh, we're gonna buy your company. We're gonna keep all your employees, all 600 employees will keep their jobs, but our new CEO is gonna run it so we don't need you. So as soon as I buy it, Thanks. I said, great, that's okay, no problem. I didn't want to run a company that I didn't, didn't any longer own. I thought about that, and this was exciting because other offers we'd had, they wanted me to stay on for two years or five years, and there were performance, uh, pay for performance clauses and so on. So I said, okay, I, I think I can live with that one. The second one, he says, this is the most important one, and if you say no to this one, the deal's off. And I said, okay. And he looked me right in the eye and he was very serious. And I thought, great, this is going to be a deal killer. And he looked at me and he says, Mike, you have to take cash for this deal. And I held a straight face as long as I could for two or three seconds and said, okay, that's fine. We had assumed they were going to give us uh, stock in their company and we didn't want stock in their company. And so that, that was it. Within a week, the, the company had been sold and I was sitting around saying, okay, what am I going to do next? That experience of starting a company from concept to cash flow to becoming an envy in the industry to having multiple buyers want the company was one of the greatest experiences I had had in my career during my life. And so I thought, I'm going to help other people do this. That's the next phase of my career. I'm going to help other people have that same experience that I have had. So what I started doing is I started traveling around America and I started finding the top entrepreneurs in every business category, all the government categories for business. I would say, who's leading this category? Who are the new up and coming entrepreneurs? And I would go out and I would follow them around with a tape recorder or with a video camera. And I did this for years, three years straight full time. And I asked them to tell me the story of their business. So now I have collected hundreds of oral histories of entrepreneurs from around the country. And the objective was to see if there are some common practices that entrepreneurs uh, use and implement that win at this game of building and growing and sustaining a small business that the failures don't do. 
So what would you guess, just by the show of hands, if we interview hundreds of entrepreneurs, are we going to find anything in common? Do you think we would? Okay. Well, we were surprised that uh, every story was a little bit different. However, we kept finding the same five or six or eight or seven or ten things in all these stories over and over again. So we've continued this project. We call it the Oral History Project, and now we're all doing all of this on high-definition videos, but we have hundreds of stories of people saying, here's where the idea came from. Here's how I got it started. Here's how I built my team. Here's how I funded this. Here's how I sustained this over time. And so we have now created, and we use this model at the Huntsman School of Business. It's called the Entrepreneurial Leadership Model, and it is a set of practices that our most successful business builders use across America. And these practices are found in common over and over again across all the companies that we look at. We're still collecting oral histories, and we still find these things. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about what these things are, these practices that make up this new leadership model. This is the new leadership model for the 21st century. And we believe very strongly that it applies to any kind of company that you would ever work for or start or build. So it doesn't matter if you're working for a nonprofit, for a school, for a foundation, for a church, or a for-profit business. We think that these concepts apply, and we think they are needed now today more than ever in every business because we have become a small business uh, economy. We've got to face that fact. About 20 years ago, our best economists were saying large businesses will dominate the American economy, small businesses will be insignificant, they will play on the sidelines, they will create very few jobs, create very, very little revenue, and in reality, the exact opposite has happened. We are now a small business economy where about half of our gross domestic product in America comes from small businesses. 80% uh, of our businesses in America have 20 employees or less. Only 3% of our businesses even have 100 uh, employees or more. And these small businesses are creating 80% of our new jobs every year. They're creating almost all of our new products. They're creating 90% of our new technologies. Uh, in the last 20 years, these small businesses have created 34 million jobs. Uh, the Fortune 500, the biggest companies in the country, in comparison have created how many? Does anybody know? 34 million from small businesses. How many from large corporations? No guesses? Okay. It's a minus. It's minus five million. Okay. So big corporations are teetering. They're breaking up. They're selling off divisions. They're having a difficult time competing in the world economy. And small business is basically running the American economy. So let's talk for a minute about these skills that I think that uh, we all need and that you will need no matter what kind of organization you work for. And I'm going to compare them with what we have typically taught and practice in corporate management, all right? So, here's the first one. Almost all of these successful entrepreneurs start businesses in industries that they understand intimately. About half of them have worked in the industry, so they've actually been in the industry observing customers, observing competitors, observing suppliers, understanding the products. The other half, if they haven't worked in the industry, they're very serious and frequent users of the products. So they know those products, they've purchased them, they've found out which ones work best, which ones don't work. And so, after they start their company, they continue to stay out in the field, in the chaos of the boundary of the organization, where customers and products collide or intersect. They live in the field, they don't live in corporate offices, and they're continually observing needs and observing how products are being received, and they're making quick tweaks of action to fix those products. You know the large corporations, the more successful you are, the higher you go to the top, you're five levels above the front line, you get information from the field that's filtered significantly, you never leave your office, uh, you create long-term strategies that are irrelevant to what's going on in the marketplace. And so the entrepreneurial strategy of being on the front line, being in the field, being in the boundary is absolutely critical to building a successful organization. So here's a diagram. The boundary is the edge that's outside of the corporate uh, structure, and it's where the products, the customers, the competitors, and the technologies lie. So let me give you some examples of this. Uh, this is one of my favorite entrepreneurs, uh, Gail Frankel. She has started one of the most successful juvenile products company uh, in the world. 
She did not work in the industry, but she's a mom. She has two kids. She formed a woman's group. They would meet at the mall every day with their strollers before the mall opened in Dallas, Texas, and they would push their strollers around and talk about parenting and being a mom. And they would talk about products that they needed, things that they couldn't find in the marketplace. One of the first things they noticed is that they couldn't carry anything on these strollers. The mall would open, they would buy a bag, they'd have some groceries, they would have something they'd purchased, they'd have a lemonade for their child, they'd have a purse, and there was nowhere to put anything on this stroller. So she said one week, I will go out and find a product that we can put on our stroller and carry our stuff around with. So she looked all over the country and couldn't find anything like it. So she went back to her woman's group and they sat down and designed something. And they all said, if you make that, we will buy that. We guarantee it. So here's what she did. She went to a manufacturer and she had a, a designer build a prototype of a stroller holder. And she had a manufacturer standing by that could produce these and deliver these in three weeks. So all she had was a prototype. She went to the Dallas Juvenile Product Show and put that product on a stroller in a booth to see if anyone might buy it. So she was going to test her idea before she invested any time or money. She sold 3,000 that she didn't have. So she went to the manufacturer, make them quick, deliver them. And so now this is her business model. She meets with women every single week that are raising children. She says, what do you need that you can't find? Help me design it. Will you buy it if I build it? And she creates a whole host of products that no one else has ever conceived of in the marketplace by being with the women that are purchasing her products every single week. So this is a great device. Uh, there's a zipper at the bottom here. You put all the bathtub toys in there and zip it, and they drip dry after the bath. And when you take a bath, you unzip it, and everything falls into the bathtub. She sold millions of these. Uh, a squeezer feeder feed your child while you're traveling without a mess, a shampoo visor so you won't get shampoo in this child's eyes. This guy doesn't need one, he doesn't have any hair, but uh, one, of, one of my favorite devices that she has created, it's a bathtub mat that you put at the bottom of the bathtub and it's an elephant with three balloons in its trunk and one balloon says too hot, one says too cold, and one says just right. So you turn on the water and you see which balloon lights up and you adjust the temperature. So that's what she's all about, being with moms that use her product. She never goes and sits in an office anywhere. Here's another example. I like to ride my bike a lot. And uh, these guys, Crank Brothers, make the very, very best bicycle components. And here's another example of what I'm talking about. It's very difficult to create products in an area in which you don't personally participate. Dave Neeleman has started four airlines, the most successful airline executive ever. He never goes to an office. He flies on his airplanes. Uh, I spent two days with him in Brazil recently uh, at Azul Airlines. He is out in the field. He checks in like customers. He talks to customers. He sits on the plane. He walks up and down the plane. He looks for things that aren't working and he fixes them immediately. Uh, he never goes to an office. When I was in Brazil with him, he and his CEO, who's a Brazilian, they had flown on three flights and talked to 450 customers the week I was there. Okay? So here's the principle. It's very simple. In its simplest form, business is a transaction between you and customers that need things. And if you are the strategic planner and the business owner and you're in some corporate office and you're not even interacting with your marketplace, you're not intimately involved in the fabric of your business, uh, you're not going to succeed. So you, look, you see the show uh, Undercover CEO. How many of you watched that show? I think it's really great, and, uh, and it ends the same way every single time. This big CEO of this big corporation says, I had no idea those things were going on in my company, and I think that's great. But I always think, why didn't you know those things were going on? You're the CEO of the company. Why didn't you know they were, they were going on? Okay? So this is re completely rethinking how we manage. Executives don't get bigger offices and bigger salaries. If you're involved in the strategic planning process of any organization of any size, you need to be in the field, in the boundary of the organization, where the customers and the products intersect daily. And that's what successful entrepreneurs do. Okay? So that's the first one. Does it make sense? Another one we find that's very fascinating has to do with planning. Uh, big corporations create long-term plans, uh, five-year plans, even 10-year plans. They decide where they're going, what they want to do. 
they hold rigidly to those plans, they don't get distracted, they don't let anything get in the way. Entrepreneurs, because they're out in the field with customers now every day, they see all kinds of opportunities and ways to reinvent products, to design new products, to pursue new niches, to pursue new opportunities, and they're much more involved in shorter term planning, I call it planned opportunism. Their plans are, tend to be one year rather than five to ten years. And they jump into a marketplace, they introduce a product, they see what happens, they see what's working and what's not working, and they continue to pivot to new opportunities that produce more value for that organization, more value for the customer. So what they do is they create channels of distribution, and then they figure out what else can we sell through these exact same channels. How can we economize on the channels we've already created? And then they say, what do we do with all these resources we've created? Is there anything else we can do that customers are asking for? And because they're out in the field rather than five levels up in some big bureaucracy, they see those opportunities and they move to those opportunities. So it's a little bit like this. Let's say that you want to make a gourmet Italian meal and you search for the perfect recipe and you see all the things you need to go buy at the store. So you go buy all those things. You're not going to be distracted. You've got to have every single spice and every single herb and you come back and you build that exact recipe. Uh, what an entrepreneur does is say, yeah, I'd like to build something like that someday, but let me look in the cupboard and see what I have already. I'm going to make something from what I already have. I'm going to use the resources that I already have. So let's uh, see some examples. June Morris is the only female to ever own and operate a major airline. I put this picture in because you know her. She's from Utah. Uh, she started as a travel agency on her own, was very successful, so started a formal travel uh, agency of her own that she owned rather than just a travel agent. She then saw a real opportunity in business travel. Business leaders were saying, we'd like a simple report every month of travel for our executives. So she started a business travel division. Then she realized these business leaders all take leisure trips. They have money. So she started the Morris Leisure Travel Service, which was booking people to Hawaii and California. Then she was putting so many people on jets, the next year she said, I might as well just charter jets and lease them because I'm using so many seats. And then after a few more years, she had 2,000 flights a day, and she said, why not just become an airline? So she continued to grow and pivot to new opportunities that were revealed to her once she was in the marketplace. Same with Becky Anderson. She started a retail bath and body shop. She transitioned into a wholesale manufacturer of bath and beauty supplies. One of the products was a soy candle scented product, and she built the largest soy candle manufacturing company in America. And now she's transitioned into a business that puts women in business selling directly to the consumer the products that she has created. Okay? So that concept is you have to be continually willing to change and to pivot, to pursue new opportunities, and you have to build a portfolio of products, and they're going to change over time. I had the privilege of speaking um, in Boston a few years ago with Peter Drucker. He and I were the keynote speakers at a conference. And it was just before he passed away, just before he died. And he got up, he was in his 90s, and he said, he says, I am predicting that in the future decades, companies will have portfolios of products, just like a stock market, where you'll have 20% at the top that you're continually working that bring your revenue. You'll have 60% in the middle that continue to bring revenue until they burn out. And then you'll have about 20% of your products that you should just let phase out. So it's the portfolio of products concept that you continue to pivot to because you're in a marketplace and you're seeing opportunities and you're not rigidly bound to a long-term strategy. Make sense? Okay. We will have some time for some questions, so uh, just keep them uh, in mind for a few minutes. So I'll go through these quickly. The next thing we noticed is that these successful entrepreneurs are incredible networkers. They build a brain trust of people around them that know a lot of things that they don't know, but that they may need to tap into along the way. So they're not afraid to call anybody about anything. And uh, they recognize that I have some strengths, but I need someone that knows manufacturing. I need someone that knows importing from China. I need someone that knows social media. And they, they co-opt a group of friends or mentors or partners around them to give them this information very, very quickly. And they'll regularly take them to lunch, call them on the phone, email them, and so on. So building your network of advisors is absolutely critical to, to growth. 
And I'll just quickly pass over this. This woman is one of the top uh, new entrepreneurs in America. She's created a whole host of household products. Her first product here, Clocky, is an amazing device. Have any of you ever seen this or used this? Okay, it's an alarm clock. It goes off. You can hit the snooze button one time. Two minutes later, if you're not out of bed and you don't turn that thing off, those wheels start turning and it makes the most loud, obnoxious noise you've ever heard. And it rolls across your nightstand, rolls onto your floor, and rolls all across your bedroom. So you have to get out of bed to turn it off. <laughs> and you can see what she said. When, I, when we talked to her, she said, I have dozens of mentors. I've called people all over the world. And that's the only reason I got this product to market. Okay, team building. Um, we have seldom seen a single entrepreneur working alone build a successful company. Successful entrepreneurs know that they have strengths and weaknesses. They know themselves. They're comfortable with being human. They're comfortable with their humanness. That I don't know everything and I'm not that good at some things. And some people know more than I do. And they figure out a way to co-op the team of entrepreneurs around them which will allow them to move much faster and get a lot more done. They're willing to s accept a smaller piece uh, of a bigger pie, basically. And even if they don't give away ownership, they create a pay for performance plan where if you join my team and we make this thing successful, you have an unlimited uh, access to our revenue. I'm going to reward you handsomely for helping around here. And. Uh, this is one of my favorite entrepreneurs. He's now the entrepreneur and resident at Harvard Business School. But you can just read his quote there. He has built uh, several successful companies. Uh, the second one, Affinity Labs, from the minute he conceived the idea till he built it until he sold it was 14 months. So he had the idea one day. He put the team around him the first month. He built the company with limited resources. He sold it to Monster Inc. for $80 million 14 months after he had the idea with this incredible team of executives that he brought in. And he says, in a war for talent, what, you have to ask yourself, what would you do to bring the right people on your team? But here's the one I really want to talk about. I've had the uh, privilege of working with the Gore family. Uh, Bill Gore created the Gore-Tex product for DuPont. In fact, he took it to DuPont and said, I've got this incredible polymer that'll change the world. And DuPont said, we don't do that. That's not part of our business plan. And he said, but people are asking for it. I got customers that want it. We don't care. We don't do that. So he violate, they violated the first principle. And so he said, OK, I want to create an ultimate company around this product. And he had observed when he was at DuPont that the best discussions that he ever had were in the carpool going to work. Four or five people in the carpool going to work, where they talked about what's really going on at DuPont. Where do we think this new product line is going? What do we think we can do with it? And then he'd go to DuPont, this big giant bureaucracy, and it was boring and no one talked to each other. And so not only did he want to create an ultimate product, he wanted to create the ultimate company. And so his thinking was that we're never going to put more than 150 people in any one building. Everyone's going to work on a team. We're going to give those teams one day a week to innovate. If they create a new product we like and we fund it, we share the revenue with that team for that product. And so he's created this company now with 8,000 associates. If you make it through your first year and you have a positive review, you get ownership in the company. So it's owned by the employees. He has buildings all over the world. and There's only 150 people in each building. And they work on product lines. And they get to innovate. And so they've introduced thousands of products in the medical industry the outdoor wear industry, uh, the military industry. And when I was there back at their corporate office, I heard this great story. There was a guy that um, he loved to ride his bike every day, and he was constantly replacing his bike cables. And he thought, if I rub this polymer on my bike cables, this Gore-Tex uh, solution, I bet my bike cables won't wear out as often. So he put the polymer on the cables, and his cables lasted forever. So he went to his team and said, there's a team of eight now. We've got to create new bike cables. And they said, ah, we don't like biking. That's no big deal now. Nah, we're not interested. So if you can't get your team interested, you can't get the thing funded from Gore, and you can't participate in the product. So after about a year, he finally convinced them, well, let's do it on guitar strings. And they all said, yeah, we like guitars. That's cool. Let's do it on guitar strings. 
So they learned to paint this polymer on guitar strings and they introduced that into the marketplace and in two years, they now control 50% of the world market for guitar strings. And it was created by this team at Gore. So they've created a beehive of entrepreneurial activity in a corporation of 8,000 employees that does two billion in sales. So these concepts will actually work in any kind of organization. Do you know what the name of those guitar strings are? Anybody? Elixir, Elixir guitar strings, okay. Um, this is very, very obvious. We see this uh, in every single interview we have with every single successful entrepreneur. You gotta love what you're doing. You gotta be really excited about it. You gotta, you gotta say, I'm gonna make this work no matter what. I love this. I have passion for it. And if you can't generate that kind of excitement and sustain it for that three, three or four or five years, uh, the company will never get started. If you start it, it'll never grow. If, you, if it grows a little bit, it'll never sustain itself. And so it's this passionate tenacity, this desire to make this work. Um, the book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers discusses this concept where he shows that everyone that succeeds in business or athletics or the arts has invested 10,000 hours into that project. So 10,000 hours is about eight to 10 hours a day for three and a half years. And be, that's what it takes to really make something work, to pivot to the right opportunities, to gain traction, to maintain your enthusiasm and excitement. And in my opinion, talking to so many of these new entrepreneurs that are so successful, you have a good idea, you put a good team around it, you pivot until it gets traction, but you sustain it with this kind of passion and drive, drive where you're just not gonna quit. Uh, I wish we had a little bit more time, but this is the number one female New Age pianist in the world, Lori Lyne. She was rejected by every single music label in the world, 30 plus, because they said people don't wanna to listen to just piano music. But she was playing, uh, she was actually playing in Dayton's department store in Minneapolis and, and she would play at night and she would get requests for CDs every single night. Do you have a CD? And she would laugh and say, no, I have a real job during the day. I'm just playing the piano here. And after she got hundreds of those requests, she started mailing off to these uh, record labels saying, people want to buy my music. And they laughed and said, no one wants to buy your music. So it's a story of you know, five years of passion and tenacity where she actually started collecting names and saying, if I make a CD, will you buy it? And as soon as she had a thousand names, she produced a CE and sold it and had immediate cash flow. She raised thousands of dollars. And then what she would do is she would put the CDs in gift stores on consignment all across America. And as soon as that gift store sold 100 copies, she would then go and do a concert in that city. She did 200 concerts. And before long, she is now the uh, top selling pianist uh, in the world. She has the biggest sheet music company and uh, it was just pure pa passion, tenacity in an industry that rejected her, that put her to the top of the industry. Uh, this one is, is great. We didn't expect to see this, but almost every business entrepreneur we interviewed that has become highly successful went into business undercapitalized by industry standards. They had less money than the experts told them they needed to have to start a business in that industry. And what they learned to do is they learned to finagle. They used, learned to borrow things. They learned to rent things. They lease before they buy. They use other people's resources. They build this brain trust of advisors. They bring people in to work for uh, equity. And it's because they, they can't get any money. Banks won't give them money. Venture capitalists won't give them any money. And they learned that there are many, many resources out there and there are always ways to get things done with less money than you think. You can produce the same results with fewer resources every single time. And uh, here's an example. Um, Josh built two companies. You probably know about Mosey, but he raised $60 million for Scale 8. It's a uh, storage company, data, off, offline data storage company. And uh, he opened offices all around the country. He spent millions of dollars. He advertised, he bought expensive furniture. It was a business success, but a financial failure because they spent way too much money getting it started. Uh, they sold the patents to Intel, closed down scale eight. He said, next time I'm gonna do it right. He spent, he built the exact same kind of company under the brand name Mosey, but he spent 3% of the money to get it started. 
and he quickly produced sales and he sold it. But here's the quote that I like so much, too much money makes you stupid. How's that? Okay. So in the consulting clients that, that we work with our firm, we can sit down with any executive team and say, let's define exactly what results you want to produce and make sure we're very clear about those results. And then let's spend a day or two days together and say, what are all the ways we can do this without spending lots of money? And there are always ways to get things done very effectively meet, to meet your objectives and not put as much money into, into the business. And then you become the low cost provider as a low-cost provider, you have complete control of your destiny. You can keep your price as high and you have a bigger margin than your competitors, or you can lower your price and pick up market share. I think the battleground of this decade is customer service. There are more products available than ever before through more channels of distribution, through e-commerce, through uh, Amazon, through buying used items, through wholesale, through retail, through outlet malls, catalogs, and people do business with companies that treat them really well. So when you go into a business, you have certain expectations, and if those expectations are met, you say, I'm pretty satisfied. <laughs> but having your expectations met doesn't mean you're loyal. You'll go somewhere else to another business next week or next month. The only way to have loyal customers is you have to give them more than what they expect to receive in that transaction. You have to violate their expectations on the high side and have them come out going, wow, no one in this business does this for me. Let me tell you what they did. You have to create the kind of experience and transaction that people will talk about. It has to be better than what they thought they were going to get. And I say the service is in the system. So when you're a small business and you're the owner and you're the entrepreneur, it's easy for you to go sell those first few accounts. It's easy for you to give fabulous service. But what do you do when you get bigger? and you have other people on your team giving that service and providing that service. Well, you have to create a system that perpetuates excellent service no matter who comes into your place of business. And uh, the challenge that I had, I had 600 employees, 90% of them were under 20 years of age. So it was like the dad of 600 teenagers. I was the dad, 600 teenagers. They were serving a million customers a day my 600 teenagers. So what do you do? We, we could have a whole discussion on that. We don't have time. But we created a system that perpetuated that service over and over and over again. And first of all, we had our customers define this profile. We said we, we had customers as partner groups in Phoenix, in LA, in Las Vegas, in Salt Lake City. And we said, if we, if we were to blow your minds, if you, if you use our business and you come out going, wow, that is unbelievable. These guys are like nobody else. We would say, what do we have to do for you? What do we have to do for you to say that? And we would have them define the experience. They would say, wow, if you would do this for us, uh, you probably can't, but if you could, and we'd say, no, we, we can probably do it, what is it? And then we designed an entire human resource system around that profile of phenomenal service where we would only recruit people that had proven they could do it naturally on previous jobs. We would train them in those key behaviors over and over and over again. We would evaluate them every single week in every retail unit and every wholesale uh, operation. Customers would evaluate those, them on that same profile, and then we would reward them based on those profiles. So we had young 17, 18-year-old kids doing amazing things, and they had the freedom to make sure that customer was absolutely enthused and, and uh, wowed by that experience. So the, the service is in the system. Okay, let me conclude here. Um, of the hundreds of entrepreneurs we've interviewed that are building successful companies of all sizes, small and large, and sustaining those companies over a time period, 10 plus years, we've only found three people that said, I did this because I wanted to make a lot of money. Only three people. Even mentioned money. They were passionate to make a difference in the world. They were passionate to provide a better product. They were passionate to provide a better product experience. They were passionate to create jobs. They were passionate to have money flow through them rather than to them to flow through them. 
and they were involved in buying uniforms for the local pep club and uh, supporting the local soccer teams and donating money to charities to helping to rebuild schools and cathedrals. They were doing something that was broader than their business and the business was the vehicle that allowed them to do that. And it was just unbelievable. We didn't expect this, but over and over and over again, they told us why they were doing what they were doing and it didn't have anything to do with money. So if money is the objective, there are a lot of ways to make money quicker than building a business and running a small business. And uh, the advantage of this, of linking out to a broader community and making a difference in that community is that it endears that community to that business. That was not their strategy originally. They weren't saying, I'm gonna go do something cool in the community so they will like us so we will then make more money. They were saying, I really wanna give back to this customer base that helped us to become who we are. And I'm gonna do this because I'm passionate about this. And then the community says, wow, they're helping us, let's help them. And uh, I think as the years go by, if there's not a social component or a community-based component to our businesses, that we aren't going to be able to compete. It's this new millennial generation that we've studied so much that is the new job market. They're saying, I only wanna work for companies that have strong values and that are making a difference. And I will work for less money for a company like that than for a company that, that I don't like or don't identify with their values or aren't socially responsible. Let me just let you read that quote. He's the benefactor of the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State. Uh, John has told me the only reason he ever started his company was that he wanted to make a difference in the world and that everything he earned would flow through him to his communities. And I know from being with him, traveling with him, uh, he goes into a country and he goes right to the king or the prime minister or the president and says, we're buying this plant here. We think, think it's a privilege to be in your nation. We're going to have 3,000 employees here. What can we do for you? What do you need done? How can we contribute for being in your country? And he has service projects in every country in which they have business. Probably the most interesting story, I'll conclude with this, uh, a gentleman named Marty Shi. Marty Shi was a flower boy on the streets of California. He was from Taiwan. And he had this idea. It was so hard as an immigrant speaking a, an Asian language to come and settle in America that he thought there's millions of them in America. What if I create a service where we welcome Asian immigrants and we offer them services in their own language, Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, and so on. And we help them find uh, rental cars, hotels, apartments, cell phones, cable services. So he became a broker of services to immigrants where he would then talk to them in their own languages. So he hired some employees, put them in the basement of a building. He had one to speak each of the Asian languages. He put ads in all the local LA papers saying, we can help you get insurance, we can help you get a car, we can help you get flowers, we can help you get a cell phone. And they sat there so excited and for three weeks the phone didn't ring one time. So he thought, oh great, Marty, that was a good idea. And then he had this super idea. He says, we've got a link to this community. He said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna offer a free 911 service in the six Asian languages and a free 411 information service in these languages. And we're gonna advertise that if you're new here and you don't speak English and you need some help, if you have a disaster and need to get to the police, but you can't talk to them because you don't speak English, call us. So as soon as those ads hit, phones started ringing off the hook. And they were referring people to the police department, the fire department, and to different places where they needed, needed services as immigrants. Uh, by the end of the second year, he was now doing $200 million in sales of the products that he was brokering. So he served the community first. The community was endeared to him. He built a strong business around that community. So that's pretty much um, what we have found. As I mentioned, we are in a small business economy. These practices will work for any type of organization. And uh, uh, the more that we learn how to apply these, I think the more successful that we can be. Yes? So the business you created first before you went and figured all this out, how many of these points did you embed in your original business? I have uh, created and launched seven companies. The first company, um, it was the big failure. 
and I didn't do any of those things. The second company uh, was very, very successful. That's the one we sold to the company in Canada. And we've used these things ever since. Okay? So we didn't know the industry. I didn't put the right team together. Uh, we just didn't know what we were doing, basically. Okay. How about one more question? Yeah. You noted uh, in developing exceptional customer service systems that you would involve the end user in that so that you understood what your customer expected as far as service went. What would make that an exceptional experience for them? Can you speak any more about what else that would contain that system? Yeah. We, we have done this with um, almost every kind of company in every kind of industry. We've recently done it with a law firm. And the practice is very simple. You get the people together that use you, and in, with this law firm, we got clients together that had fired them, that fired the law firm. And we said, if this law firm were to be the best law firm in this space, what would they have to do? And they would say, well, we'd like them to do this, but we know they can't do that. And we'd say, no, 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 they can do, they can choose to do whatever they want. What would you like them to do? And we took those, that profile back to the executive team at the law firm. And the first thing they said is, we can't do this. And by the end of the week, they were doing it. And they've become one of the top firms in their niche. Uh, so it's, it's really finding out what do you have to do to blow people's minds? And then it's your responsibility to go back and see if it's capable for you to create a system of processes around that wish list. We've done it with uh, you know, uh, auto repair shops, law firms, schools, uh, retail companies. So hey, thank you very much. It was great being with you here this morning. <laughs>